we are talking about the path to definition and uh, I defined the critical result shear stress is the minimum value of the stress at which plastic deformation occurs in the material. And we saw that while we are talking about the result shear stress, the mechanism of deformation by and large is a slip in most materials at most temperatures. And then we saw that the estimate of the result shear stress required to make the plastic deformation begin in the material or to cause a slip in the material made a very simple estimate and that turned out to be we use the shear modulus and therefore the shear minimum value of the stress required should be this and I should be able to apply that much stress in the elastic region. But what our observations are to the contrary and uh, before I talk of the role of this location I will show you the what is that contrast in the observation as compared to the work value of the result shows us the critical value we were about. We have different materials, common lowest materials, copper, aluminum, gold, nickel, silver, iron and zinc. The crystal structures are given here. And the critical result shows us what we observe is 0.5 megapascal. Well, uh, let me again remind you that this course and also internationally all the strength values or the, uh, the material are given in terms of megapascal, whether it's the real strength or the tensile strength or the flow stress. Well, when it comes to defining the modulus, it is always defined as in gigapascal units. Well, here I give the mu by 6 on the last column, which turns out to be for copper 7330 instead of 0.5. That means it's more than 14,000 times is the value of the mu by 6. The actual value, what we observe in copper is 1 upon 14,000. It's more than 4 orders of magnitude, less. The difference on most of them you will find is 3 to 4 orders of magnitude. This is a large difference. Where have I gone wrong? I made a simple estimate. There could be a small factor of 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, things like that, I, if I made an error somewhere. But I made a very small, simple estimate, still that's a very good estimate, really speaking, and the values that I observe are very different, much, much less. Right? So that's where we uh, start to think what is wrong in our estimate and what is going, what is happening in the real materials. What we find is, But this critical result shear stress which I worked out, at the most I should call it the ideal strength of the perfect crystal. This is how the slip or the deformation occurs in the material. The same effect can also be produced if I have an edge dislocation like this and I apply the shear stress in this manner. So here also I am applying the shear stress in this manner. 
and then it is like this. And you recall that when I talked about the slip motion of the dislocations, this dislocation can go out ultimately.
So muscle is able to move up and down. It's not gliding against. The result is as if it is gliding against the surface. Same thing is here. The dislocation is moving in a material exactly the same fashion. The effort at each step is much, much smaller. And as a result, the net strength of the material or the critical exertion stress of the material is the effort which you require to make it move from one step to the next. And it ends up in getting me a plaster deformation once the dislocation gets to the surface. Is this clear?
reason, there are no distortions or planes are flat vertically. The words, the distance between the atom which are here, so that's the bond length. The distance between the atom which is here, there are two bond lengths. Perhaps there is a slit here in the material. Somebody has removed that plane, but they have not come closer. Where are the displacements located in this? Where are the displacements? Tabulate the dislocation line. As a boundary between the slip part and the slip part. And there is a displacement of that slip, what we call the Bose's vector. All the displacement we call the magnitude of the Bose's vector, where is it located? It is located right here. Else? If I show here, all right. This is x equal to 0 where the dislocation is, minus b by 2 displacement here, plus b by 2 displacement there, and total displacement is right here. It is a similarity there that way at one spot. Such a dislocation has a 0 width. Displacements are carried over to 10, 20 planes depending upon how the curve material is or how flexible the bonds are. These bonds are very rigid probably like in diamond. Bond angles cannot change. But when the bond angles are changed, you see, because it's a flexible bond. It is not such a rigid bond. In a typical metal, it can go up to even up to 500,000 planes like copper. This is a dislocation which has a high width and displacements here I would say this is minus b by 2 x plus b by 2 and like this. So the width of the dislocation is very large. Displacements are spread over from this end to that end around the dislocation line, and dislocation line is right here. So such a dislocation has a high width. Now you can tell me that I have to apply the shear stress in this situation, or I have to apply the shear stress in this situation. How much? movement I have to make for this atom so that it bonds with the next one. <laughs> it comes the Bose's vector right away. And that is what the model I took when I tried to work out how much stress is required to make the dislocation slip. What I call the critical result stress, stress as is for the ideal strength of the perfect crystal. That is what is going to happen here. The zero width dislocation has a low dislocation. I had to put, lift the whole plane and put it in the next equilibrium position. But in here the effort required is a fraction of the radius. And this will not end up giving me a uh, displacement. Right? So effort here is much less than the effort there. So more the width of the dislocation, less is your critical result shear stress. Or the minimum stress required to make the dislocation slip now. So, essentially, now critical result shear stress is that level of the stress or that minimum level of the stress at which the dislocation can slip in the given crystal. And that will be less here, it will be, it will be almost near a 6 year, that will be less here. And that is the effect of the width of the dislocation. Second thing is the magnitude of this vector. If the Bogus vector is large, even if the 
this one picture has a high weight, a displacement in one step, which I require. When will you know? I found you have to be more. And the biggest vector of the dislocation is small. At any step, I have to move on a small movement. So, we do less. So, these are the two things which control the critical junctures so and stress required to make the dislocation slip. So, if the width of the dislocation is small, stress required will be high, applied stress hour. And the magnitude of the biggest vector is large, again, I will have to apply high stress. So, material will be stronger, strength will be high, strength will be higher for this material if the width of the dislocation is small and the magnitude of the biggest vector is large. On the other hand, if the width of the dislocation is large and the magnitude of the biggest vector is small, I shall have a lower value this time. Okay? Steel, light steel, water steel, as compared to aluminum, water 
capacity. Okay. Then you have ionic crystals. Here, it's not so much the width of the dislocation, but the this factor. It's not the nearest distance between two ions. Just like in diamond. If I make the nearest distance between two ions, then when there is a slip taking place or there is a formation of dislocation, two ions of the same sign can just come opposite each other and there will be strong repulsion. So, width of the, the bonus vector is larger here in ionic crystals. So, in this case, is the bonus vector which is larger causes the strength to go up. And these materials are also stronger, but at the same time better. Like the covalent limited material. Right. Uh, having <coughs> seen this effect of the width of the dislocation and the bonus factor, once we understand that, we have to look at the partial metals and typical metals where the plastic deformation occurs by and large. And we deal with these materials as structural materials as engineers we explore them. Now the slip motion of the dislocation is also a thermally activated process. But thermal energy provides a jump in all possible direction to the dislocation. So net result is dislocation doesn't move. It stays where it is. Because the thermally activated process, thermal energy provides for random happenings. Atoms are jumping randomly to the right, to the left, up, below. So, as a result, dislocation remains where it is. Net result is zero movement. Only when the applied stress is there, it provides a direction. Then thermal energy also assists. So, the slip motion dislocation is assisted by the applied stress. And of course, there is a role of thermal energy because it is a thermally activated process. So, as the temperature goes up, there is a more role of thermal energy. So, applied stress becomes less effect because that is only providing direction. As the temperature is lower, applied stress has to go up because thermal energy is providing less effect. The less in the low energy available, so low effect from the And if it is a thermally activated process, it is also possible for you to write, like in the Arrhenius relationship, the rate of deformation which you get in the material. Okay? Now, it is possible, let me write it for you, the strain rate can be written as some constant times exponential of minus q by rt, which is the thermal energy rate thermally activated process, the activation energy. That is provided by thermal energy essentially and that has to be pulse under the stress, that is the stress at the thermal activation required 0 Kelvin minus the applied stress at any other temperature. Uh, convert this into stress into energy or multiplied by the activation volume. Activation volume is volume around the dislocation where the effort has to be applied by the thermal energy divided by RT. We should be able to explain many things how the applied stress changes with temperature and things like that. Suppose I maintain the constant strain rate at all temperatures. When we are testing we did a test by acting and your strain rate was not uniform anyway. But if you put in, let us say, consider a motor there, it moves at the same speed, so strain rate will be uniform. When you test it at room temperature, you test it at 200 degrees centigrade or test it just below the melting point. Okay? So, if that is the case, strain rate is a constant, then what is the applied stress as a function of temperature? At 
means this number should be constant. For this number to be constant, the numerator term tells in the arrow that is t tau p n minus tau a applied stress. This difference must be, this divided by temperature must be constant. So, temperature increases, that difference must increase. That means applied stress must go down because that is a constant. That is a constant of the material. So, as the temperature rises, stress required to cause plastic deformation in the material decreases. In other words, the strength, the strength of the material goes down as the temperature increases. Right? That's what I have shown here. I plot the temperature divided by the melting point. This will be 0 Kelvin, 0 here, and melting point will be 1. Nickel, which is FCC, 18-8 stainless steel, that is 18 percent chromium, 8 percent nickel. So, normally the stainless steel which we use, that is uh, FCC material, austenitic stainless steel. These three FCC materials, you see, have a very small dependence on temperature, except in stainless steel, little more. And nickel also because the end of the uh, tension method. But copper is also the tension metal, its dependence is very low in the temperature. It does not increase, it increases a lot because at the strain that says that shown, so therefore there is a dependence is small. However, when you go to a typical tension metal like iron or tungsten, it increases very rapidly as the temperature is lowered. At high temperatures again, small dependence, at low temperature the dependence is very strong. It's partial core in nature, the bond plays well there. But these are the L203 and silicon. L203 is the ionic bond, silicon is a covalent bond. See that dependence is very strong on temperature. It's a very strong dependence on temperature for these materials. While here the dependence is low at the high temperature but very strong at low temperatures, very close to the zero calorie. Right, so that is the dependence on temperature, that is what uh, of, of the yield strength of the material. Well, if that is the case, the dislocations are responsible for causing partial deformation of the material. And once a dislocation gets out of the crystal, it is no more available to slip. It cannot cause any more further deformation. So, any dislocation which is present in the crystal gives me a step of equivalent to one bogus vector, which is a permanent change in shape of the crystal. Only one bogus vector. If I have, let us say, 100 dislocations in a crystal, I will get 100 bogus vector. I will get dislocation out. Now, I am lucky, perfect crystal. To get more deformation, now I should apply this thing, stress of the order mu by 6. And that this strain which you will get is a very small negligible strain. Even if I have a dislocation density of 10 to the power 10 meter per cubic meter in a crystal, I will not get more than 0.2 percent strain. Very small strain I shall get. But you have deformed this solid like uh, steel, you have deformed like aluminum, that quite a few percent of elongation you get. Strains you get are very high. Okay. How do you get that? That means there should be a supply of dislocations inside the crystal. Dislocations rather multiply when we start deforming material. And the number keeps increasing, but I shall demonstrate with the help of something what I call the finite source. There could be a variety of sources of material, let us just worry about one. And we should say that. How the dislocation number increases when the, the dislocation begins to slip. We know that all dislocation which are present in the solid, they are not straight lines, screw or edge dislocations. They are zigzag, curvilinear lines, mixed dislocations kind of things. Right? So I show over here amongst that 
zigzag a simple model of a dislocation which is possible for to get that a dislocation line PQ which is actually PABQ. P lies on the vertical plane which is shown there and AB lies on a horizontal plane which is this pink plane and BQ lies on this another one which is the front the vertical plane. So there is a dislocation P A B Q which lies on three planes. One part of it lies on the plane P A uh, on, on the plane on the vertical plane rather I should say that's a vertical plane. This is also a vertical plane. But this is the horizontal plane. A B part lies on this. Let's say on this crystal or upon the shear stress, in this fashion. I am trying to top up to the right and bottom to the left. Okay? Shear stress is always shown by 2. It has to be this. Okay? Never by one arrow. Single arrow doesn't show that indication. Right. So this is the stress, shear stress which I apply. What is the result component of this shear stress on the plane in which I have the component P A? Apply this, and that is on this vertical plane. Shear stress on that will be zero. And what is the shear stress component on B Q? Zero. There is no stress on component P A, there is no uh, stress on the component B Q, they will not slip. But there is a shear stress applied on the A B, it will like to slip. Huh? Any situation. Part of the dislocation will like to slip, other parts do not slip. Point A and B shall remain intact because there is a continuity of the dislocation line. This location line cannot end abruptly inside the crystal. That continuity has to be maintained at A and B. The displacements of the displaced side, non displaced side, has to be maintained at the boundary. And therefore, A and B shall remain fixed. What is the middle part of the AB somewhere here, which will find that it is not tied to A or tied to B? This will like to move. It will like to move forward. And as I told you earlier, a dislocation line slips always perpendicular to itself. Under this, suppose I consider this as the day, okay, this is the right stress, so let's consider this as to be a dislocation line, T vector in this direction, and it's a screw dislocation, I'm oh, sorry, L dislocation, the bulk vector in that direction. So, T is in that direction, B is in this direction, I apply the shear stress. Which direction should the dislocation move? Suppose A and B were not tied. This is it negative edge or positive edge? Positive edge. Which way should it move? To the right. It should move to the right. Alright? Alright. So, the middle component of the AB, which is not feeling tight, shall try to move forward. Right? So, this location will move perpendicular to itself. What happens to the neighboring parts of that component? They will also have to jump in that direction because they are going to make circular position. But when, by the time you reach A, this cannot move. B, it cannot move. But at the same time, component of the dislocation which is close to A and B can rotate. Rotation also provides a slip motion perpendicular to the dislocation line T. See, if I have something like this, which rotates in this manner, the direction of motion has been all the time perpendicular to the radius. That's a tangent you draw anyway. So, rotation is also slip motion. So, at A and B dislocation begins to rotate. So, in between A and the middle part, B and the middle part, components rotate as well as jump. So, the net motion.
function remains perpendicular to this location line. Okay. So what happens is, let's now show it here. Step. In this 
motion. Dislocation line vector, as you remember, this was the T vector. That remains the same. T vector is tangential above the point. T vector is going like that in that sense. And this is the component of dislocation line between A and B. Now tell me what is happening. This is the same slope plane. What is happening here and here? Two opposing dislocations, screws are there, along the same slip plane. And the point stress is making them move towards each other. At the moment, the next step comes there cancel each other. So, what I get is the part which is not cancelled on this side and the part which is not cancelled on this side. And that's when the middle is cancelled. So, there is no dislocation there. But I have got a loop here and that dislocation there, which under the applied stress shall quickly jump back to the original AB and this will slowly with time will become a circular loop as it moves further because this motion will go like this and will keep cancelling you know ultimately it has to become a circular loop so this portion will keep cancelling and we will have ultimately a loop with the T vector going like this. So, we got back to your original component A, B of the dislocation line and you got a loop and you still apply that maximum stress term. So, it will again become a semicircle. Once this becomes a semicircle, it will again form a loop. And loop, what forms? Again, I will get back my segment AB. Says so, I apply the same stress tau. It will again form a semicircle. So, it will keep forming. This is called a source. This has become a source of dislocations. So, when the first dislocation goes out, it gives me a step. I am going down out of the crystal. Second one comes, goes out, there is another step. So, I keep getting deformation after deformation. <coughs> down out of the lab. Concentric circles. Yes. Why? Why won't they overlap? Yes. Because this circle and this circle both are on the same side. And other plants turn both move in the same direction. So, they will keep moving. They will not overlap. They will not cross each other. The reason the one, one is going over the crystal and the second one coming down, that goes over the crystal is in more step. So, steps and steps, the formation goes on. That is why it is called a source of dislocations. And to the surface, up to the source, I will have large number of dislocations, loops. This is called a pileup of dislocation. If the front one is obstructed somewhere, it will become a pileup. And the first dislocation is called a loading dislocation. And this becomes a pileup of dislocations. Right? 
assume that when you become the service circle, I have to apply the maximum stress. Let me just tell you what is the value of the stress. But this is point A, this is B. The distance between A and B. Let's say L. This is the distance L. B is the magnitude of the Borges vector. Mu is the shear modulus. And is called the length of the flank rate source.